Habit and discipline are the principles that champion bodybuilder and powerlifter Giacomo Marchese lives by. And of course, the plant-based lifestyle. Vegan for 10 years, Giacomo and his plant-based bodybuilder wife, Danny Taylor, joined forces to create a community of plant-based bodybuilders. It was about time for the bodybuilding world to accept those that chose a plant-based diet instead of shun them. Their team, called Plant Built, is the largest and most diverse team of strength-based athletes in the world. And their message is being heard by the fitness world, as this year marked the first time Giacomo's team had a dedicated presence at the Olympia competition in Las Vegas. So today we welcome Giacomo to the podcast. To him, there is nothing magical about success. It's simply the result of a lot of small things done well. And what would he say is the major difference between himself and a, quote, regular meat-eating athlete? Veganism offers a compassionate way of life for me, he says, a way to respect the environment and all walks of life that cover this earth, a way that makes me feel whole. Welcome, Giacomo. Thank you so much for being with us. We're excited. You're our first bodybuilder on the show. <laughs> Cool. Can we see something there just a little bit? So everyone there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Built awesome. by plants, people. <laughs> Very nice. That's great. Uh, how did you come to veganism and a plant-based lifestyle? Veganism is something that I was completely unfamiliar with growing up. I honestly didn't even know that the word vegan existed. I had no exposure to it whatsoever. Growing up, I got into fitness first. And then as a young adult, I got into the competitive side of things and decided to do a bodybuilding show. And that, you know, it really made me understand and learn my body better to get it to do something that was extreme to the point of being somewhat unhealthy, but for the, for the performance, for the competition, but it also taught me a lot about my body and, uh, and it, it let me be healthier over time. Anyway, someone very close to me had a heart attack and I wanted to help them reverse their heart disease. And that's when I started to do my own research and that's how I stumbled onto veganism. And it just made sense to me. And I figured I had to lead by example and, uh, and tested it out on myself. And my performance wasn't hurting. Uh, I felt just as healthy as not, if not healthier. And I felt it was an opportunity to show others. So way. you just said something that you hear a lot of vegans say, and you hear a lot of meat eaters say the opposite. You said, it just made sense to me. You were searching for an answer for your friend with your heart disease, but through that process, you came upon this and it made sense. What? What struck you as making sense? Like what just collected in your head and organized and said, I, I get this? Well, it was from a health standpoint, it was pretty simple uh, as far as what just made sense to me. Um, Cause at that point in time, I had never made like the, the full connection of veganism as a lifestyle. But from a health-based standpoint, I said to myself, well, if excess cholesterol in the body can clog your arteries and make it harder for your heart to work and eventually lead to heart disease, to the point where like you have to constantly manage your uh your uh your system maybe taking in less to no dietary cholesterol can help and that and that was how it clicked for me and so you know that it was good for your health but you were also passionate about bodybuilding what did it do for your bodybuilding well the other way that i looked at things was anything that's plant-based i mean Anything that's plant-based is where you're going to get most of your vitamins, your minerals, your antioxidants, your phytonutrients, your nutrition in. So I said to myself, if I'm getting in the same amount of protein, the same amount of carbohydrates, the same amount of fats that I would normally get in as an omnivore, as a meat eater, and if I just do that in a plant-based way, I'll probably be getting in more micronutrients as well. And I couldn't see that being a bad thing. But it's harder to get in some mi micronutrients through plants because plants have a lot of density. But what, what am I saying? It's like, if, for example, for, <laughs> no, fat, no. Yeah. for fat and protein, you have to eat a lot of plants to match what <clears throat> your meat-eating counterparts are doing. Uh, because they can just eat fewer and get many more cal f fewer um, in like actual volume of food. Volume, thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. Volume, and get far more calories, far more fat, far more protein. So, how did how, what were you having to do? What were what were some of the things that you did to change your diet 
to get more of these uh, nutrients in for bodybuilding? So I think like anything else, we, we learn as we go. And in the beginning, it was definitely challenging. And I've been vegan for 15 years and information on the internet wasn't really a thing, right? But, um, but nowadays, thankfully, we have so many resources available. And uh, what I've come to learn over time is that consuming a plant-based diet and being vegan gave me the chance to be creative and gave me the ability to eat a much wider variety of foods than I otherwise would have normally been exposed to. And, you know, yes, you're right. Sometimes we do need to eat a, a greater volume of food, and that can be challenging because then our fiber can go through the roof and that can potentially cause digestive issues. And, uh, and it's like, well, how much food can you fit in your stomach? And if you're a bodybuilder, the, the idea is to, to eat more, to, to work on gaining muscle and strength. But, um, but you learn, what you do is you wind up learning what foods are more calorically dense and which foods are more voluminous. And then, and because you've explored so many different uh, foods, food sources in the plant-based kingdom, you're able to get creative with it. So when you're on a diet, you can eat voluminous foods. When you're on a bulk, you can eat calorically dense foods. I know that you and your team and <clears throat> a lot of your bros like uh, Robert Cheek and Nimai Delgado, you guys go to um, you know traditional fitness expos and do your vegan tent thing. Uh, what what do people come up and ask you guys? Are they are, are, mo are most of the people completely shocked that you look the way you do and you're able to do what they can do on plants? Are they getting more used to you guys and they understand it better? Do you feel like you're changing hearts and minds? Like, talk to me about what that's like being in the middle of an expo of omnivores. It's I know, but also people. not just omnivores, but people who, who are yeah. bodybuilders who are really steeped in dairy and meat being yeah. the thing, whey protein, casein, meat, that's the thing that yeah, makes them no strong. Doubt. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, and, and, and I agree with you, Alexandra, the, there's, there's definitely some, um, some foods that people just have that they have, a, an emotional attachment to just foods that they prefer to consume. Um, and it's definitely been an adventure over the years. Now we've been, we've been going to these expos and events for over a decade. And if you asked me 10 years ago, how people would react to us, it'd be far different than people react to these days because the information is out there and mm -hmm. it just makes sense. So like 10 years ago, for example, we wouldn't even go to a mainstream fitness event. We would go to like a vegan, a vegan event where family members would bring their veg curious brothers, sisters, friends, whatever. And they would come to the booth and they would start trolling us and be like, come on, this is a joke. Right. And they would start, you know, like attacking <laughs> us, like even in our own community. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So then we're just like, all right, there's this, we're not ready to go out into the mainstream yet. We need to grow this community and put this information out there. Fast forward to today, and I think there's been a major shift over the past, I want to say, three to five years. You go to a fit expo, and, and this is the first year that we've gone to mainstream fit expos, uh, honestly. And, and we went to our first one in Philadelphia early this year, and we were like, all right, you know, we're going to get these, these big meatheads, uh, both enhanced and non-enhanced athletes that are just very into like the meat and potato bro culture, and they're going to harass us, so they're going to make fun of us, or... Honestly, we, I can't think of a single person that has come to the booth yet that has given us a hard time. So uh, the, the mindset has definitely shifted. And nowadays, most people come to the booth and they're like, you know, I should probably be doing more of this. And they're either not ready um, or they're ready, but they just don't know how to do it. And what do you tell them when they want to know how to do it? How do you tell them to start? And by the way, you said enhanced and not, not enhanced. Does that mean that uh, those who take steroids and those who don't? Exactly. Like and, any competitive uh, sport, you're going to have those that are enhanced and not and not. Enhanced. That's a nice way to say it. In cycling, we just say dope. <laughs> but in bodybuilding, I think there's well, some there's some uh, competitions still, where it's legal. I know. Right? You can. Is that true? So We're in, fortunate with bodybuilding, actually, because you can choose to compete where you want to. You can choose to compete in natural organizations, and you can choose to compete in untested organizations. So mm. we we really it's pretty cool that we have the ability to do that. I feel like most yeah, sports so don't. There's, there's mm. less lying. Um, so tell us what you tell bodybuilders who say, I want, I want to start making some changes to eat more plants. What do like you first them? steps? Do this, this, and this. <laughs> first steps to, to making some changes. Well, the first thing I do is rather than I don't really have an agenda or I don't have anything um, to, to recommend to them, I kind of get to know them a little better. And I, I figure out what's, what makes them tick. How do they like to eat? Why are they even thinking about this? So 
the first thing that I do uh, as an activist out there is not to just be like, you need to do this, this, that, and you should be making changes because you want to. It's like, all right, you know, why, why are you thinking about this? Uh, what made you think about it? And, and then you kind of figure out why they're interested in, uh, in making a switch. And then you kind of ask them how they eat and what kind of changes they've already made or, or are looking to make. Uh, and then you just kind of give them pointers. The, the easiest way that I think to get someone started is to veganize how they're already eating. So I, you know, people like getting sold when it comes to nutrition, people like getting sold on like these sensationalized extreme ideas, do nothing but fruits and vegetables and you'll be, you'll be terrific. Uh, you know, we're going to some major detox and it's, mm. how do you, how do you promote balance? It's very hard. And I think that's our ongoing issue, but I just say, Hey, look, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Tell me how you're eating right now. You're obviously doing well for yourself as a, as a fitness enthusiast or a competitive athlete. Tell me how you're eating right now, and let's let's suggest some swaps to make your meal plan more plant based. Oh, and protein eating. powders, and maybe take the meat and do some uh, non meat meat alternatives. The protein powders are a real easy switch. Uh, you know that people were iffy about going with plant based protein powders, but these days, uh, I think people are kind of getting tired of of the standard whey protein shakes and. Uh, I think everyone understands that the amino acid profile of plant-based protein powders are the same as whey. So that's a super easy switch to suggest, and a lot of people are already doing it. And as far as the, the, meat, the meat stuff goes, sometimes people don't want a, a plant-based meat, but, but uh, sometimes they do. So I usually suggest like, hey, you, know, you, can, uh, you can replace your chicken with Beyond Meat chicken, for example, or, uh, or you could switch your burger with a, you know, with a Boca burger or whatever, and they're open to the idea. But some people are literally looking for a change, and then I'll just suggest a way to, to round out their plate with some beans and rice and vegetables and, uh, and maybe like some you know, tofu, for example. You found, uh, as far as protein powders go, because people want to know, okay, plant-based proteins, some people are going, I don't even know what that is. Do you like pea or sprouted brown rice. I know that's my favorite as far as the, the taste goes. Um, what are what are three different ones or maybe your favorites that people can go try at the store? Uh, I'd say that for the most part, a blend of pea and rice seems to be agreeable for most people. Okay. If, uh, if people have a very, very sensitive uh, stomach, I suggest to go straight brown rice because most people are able to tolerate that. Uh, you can try having straight pea protein, but because it's a little more on the starchy side, Sometimes people, it doesn't agree with people's stomachs, but a blend of pea and rice seems to be uh, okay yeah, for just well, about Yeah, it's anybody. definitely easier than whey because whey just used to rip my stomach in half. Um, yeah. <laughs> right? It's super gnarly. Yeah, there's casein. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about casein? Because that is something that I think people need to understand when they look at a label. If it says casein, that's a milk byproduct. And it's a sp uh, studies have shown that it is especially mm -hmm. bad for us. Can you talk to that at all, Giacomo? Sure. Well, uh, casein is a, I, I, what, what exactly is casein? I feel like it's, it's like the, the curds of the way, like it's, it's the, like it's, yeah, it's, it's, also it's, like it's, the, it's the, it's the protein in fork. In the movie forks over knives, you saw Dr. Campbell, his studies were done with casein, um, on rats and it showed how the cancer markers would go up when you added casein right. to the diet and right. they would go down when you took them out. And it's so, in every mammal's milk, like it's in human milk, casein and, and whey, right. the product from casein. So it's in it's in all mammals' breast milk. And I used to, I used to, when I was um, drinking milk, um, I used to drink a protein powder that had casein in it, and it always made me feel bad. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember even my nutritionist saying, you know, casein has. And she wasn't vegan at all. She said, uh, Casey has some, not a great profile. It's, so she didn't really recommend huh. it, but it didn't make me feel good at all. So anyway, folks, if you're looking at the, if it says uh, casein or whey, caseinate, things like that, that is, that's milk. So I think like, and I don't know if this still exists till this day, but the way that they marketed uh, casein versus whey protein was that casein, I guess they, they suggested that it would digest slower and you would have it at night. Mm. For protein before you go to bed, so the protein metabolizes a little slower. To me, that doesn't that doesn't really make sense to me. If anything, it's if casein is potentially more difficult to digest. I don't know what advantage that has other than being hard on your your gut. Uh, and if you want protein to digest slower, just add a little bit of fat yeah. to it. You know, put a little bit of coconut oil in your shake or peanut butter, for example. Yeah. Uh, I don't really see a need to take in a protein that's harder to digest. 
uh, to be able to to break it down slower before you go to bed. Yeah. And talk I, about I, a bad night's sleep while your gut yeah. is working overtime. You know, Giacomo, I was interested when I was reading about you and your wife, Danny. I understand Danny, she lost about 80 pounds um, and got into bodybuilding. And you yourself struggled with some weight loss that wasn't so healthy. Um, and it resonated with me because uh, I became anorexic as a teenager after getting very sick. When I got better, I swore I'd never get sick again. And I tried to be as healthy as possible. And to use your words, healthy and pure. And I just kept eliminating foods until I became afraid of food and stopped eating pretty much. And so that was the beginning of my, my actually my descent into eating disorders. And you, uh, you face something somewhat similar. Can you talk about it? Especially interesting yeah. because bodybuilding is so focused on the, how the body looks and everything. And you went from being a, a wanting to be, I have it down here, um, uh, you wanted to be larger than life and then you became anorexic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely went through all that. And, uh, and you know, those thoughts, they, they're, they're still there. They're mostly quiet, but they're, they're you know, they never really go away. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's just something you, you work through and you work on for the rest of your life. And so basically uh, as a teenager, I was never really happy with my body and I was bullied a whole lot in school and bodybuilding to me was an escape. My, music teacher got me into it. And then I got into wanting to not just perform better to make the tennis team, but to also look better. And I got more and more into bodybuilding, but I was never really quite happy with my body. And I got into the whole, like trying to gain extreme amounts of weight and then trying to lose extreme amounts of weight. That was hard on my body, not the right way to do things. But I guess long story short, I, I got into a period of time as a young adult, um, where I would just was totally unhappy with my body. And I just decided I would just become smaller and smaller because this whole muscle building thing was not for me. And I literally like just lost most of my weight um, to the point where I had to get admitted. And, uh, and I would say that was like pretty close to rock bottom for me. And, uh, and I, you know, I gave up on bodybuilding and all that. And uh, it took me, took me, I want to say, four years to start thinking about lifting again after I went through all that and worked on having a healthier relationship with food and, and my body, of course. And then I would say it took me almost 10 years to get back into deciding, okay, I want to give this bodybuilding thing another go. Uh, I, I, I tried from the very get go to heal myself through bodybuilding. And I got to this point where I failed real hard but I'm not a quitter. <laughs> so I decided, let me, let me take a second crack at this. Now that I I've learned some stuff, I feel like I'm more mature and I can handle it. And I've been doing it for the past six years successfully. And my passion now is not just in bodybuilding, but it's in helping others have a healthier relationship with food and their body and, and doing it in a balanced way. And that's kind of, I would say probably going to be one of my major life passions. Wow, what a story. I think it's really good for people to hear. Thank you for telling us that story sure. and being candid about it. Um, I'm not going to let it go yet. I have, a, I have, I a couple know, I have some questions too. <laughs> We're not going to let this go. <laughs> Sliding off this one that quick. Um, I, I, you said something in there where you had a period of time where you wanted to just get as small as possible. So obviously the opposite of um, where you are now. Uh, and that really resonated with me as I think you may know, both of us struggled from anorexia and bulimia and I almost lost my life to it. And in, um, I remember walking around New York city and pursuing a modeling career and going to different, you know, go sees. And I, um, was, uh, very sick and anorexic at the time. I remember having that same exact feeling of, I wanted to get so small that no one would notice me. Like I didn't want anyone looking at me anymore. Even I, though you were in a career, it's so interesting because I too was yeah. a model. We all put ourselves in careers that actually focus on how we look, even though we were battling it so strongly. Yeah. So, it's so it's and didn't so, want that. Didn't, it's so well, interesting. There's something yeah. different than the camera and actual eyeballs of a guy on the side of the street that's mm -hmm. staring at you. For, mm -hmm. for me, you know, just the, the the camera didn't have a face or a name or a feeling or an emotion. But, um, Giacomo, the what. What was going on emotionally from you for you when you were feeling like I want to get as small as possible? Well, uh, I, I was never really happy with the way that I fit in my clothes. I was mm -hmm. never really happy with the body that I was trying to build. Um, and, it, and it led to me going down this path where I 
literally became mentally ill and like my life was just in a, a pretty bad place actually. Um, and then I just kept getting, uh, obsessed with trying to get small and smaller. I was doing, uh, I was getting into fasting back then, which mm. I find I, in hindsight was not helpful at all. And, uh, and, and at one point, just like you, Dotsy, I, I almost lost my life. Like I, <laughs> I thank, I thank the people who encouraged me to get admitted because if I didn't, I honestly don't know if I'd be here today with the condition I was in. When I look back, I'm like, how, how did I get there? Mm. You know? But, um, yeah, it's hard to say because it's kind of a dark place that I don't reflect on too often. Mm. But I guess if I were to think about it, I just there was a there was a certain way that I wanted to look, and I felt like I could diet and get there and be there on the bodybuilding stage. Obviously, it wasn't sustainable, or I could bulk, but I, I never really was happy with the way I looked year round because I was trying to go towards these extreme measures to change my body instead of just trying to do it in a balanced. And how way. are you now in terms of how? happy you are and accepting you are of your body especially now that you're in the spotlight as a role model of both for as a vegan and as a fitness expert and and a bodybuilder there must be more pressure on you yeah i mean tr truthfully i do get a little uncomfortable sometimes when i when i am uh, in a bulking period when i gain a lot of weight um, which is probably, so put it this way, I guess I'll, I'll use like, if I'm in like, if, I'm, if I have an athletic body fat set point, an athletic body fat, I'm kind of okay. But once I start to move away from that and I get out of an athletic body fat range, I, I feel a little uncomfortable. Um, but I still try to embrace it cause I know it's necessary. The thing of it is, is that if you want to improve upon your body in a competitive fashion, you need to tell your body in every single way that it needs to perform. And as a bodybuilder, that requires you to be more assertive about your bulking. As a, as a fitness enthusiast or as a recreational bodybuilder, I think you can live in that happy medium. But when you really try to push your body to its limits, it's important to embrace that, that phase where you're literally pushing your boundaries and you're becoming uh, heavier than you'd like to. And, uh, and so that's kind of the area where I try to focus on personally. So you have to bulk up and then you start cutting so that you're ready for the stage? Eventually, yeah. As a natural bodybuilder, it takes a lot of years to change your body once, once you're, you become advanced. So my, my uh, off season will last anywhere from three to five years, for example. And it can be uncomfortable sometimes because a lot of people identify you as a bodybuilder and they think of the way you looked all ripped and shredded when you compete. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, when's your next competition? I'm like, I'm always preparing for my next competition, but this is where I need to live right now, mm -hmm. you know? And then you go to these events where everyone is, there's a lot of people that are there to compete and in peak conditioning. Mm -hmm. And then of course, when you work, when you see enhanced athletes, like they can be, they can be big and ripped at the same time. And as a natural athlete, you can't really do that. And so that can kind of be a struggle to, uh, to exist around when you choose to, to, to not use uh, steroids. So that I'd say like, that's definitely a struggle for me. But um, do you feel like there is a um, emotional uh, connection to um, complete healing through or via eating a whole food plant based diet that is full of compassion and empathy and love and nonviolence um, compared to the other and how that is affecting your emotional journey these days with food? Uh, it affects way more than just my emotional journey with food. It affects my emotional journey with relationships uh, with my fellow humans, uh, with animals, with the environment, with everything. It literally, it's, it makes me who I am today. So, and, and I, I feel like it makes me a better athlete. So you remember getting back to what you were saying earlier, how it's like, all right, well, you know, what are you doing differently than your, your meat eating counterparts that are competing? And I think that a vegan competitor's um, competitive factor is why we're doing this. When you look at people who compete as individuals and not on a team, because bodybuilding is mostly an individual sport, as is powerlifting, you know, is it, you have to be a little self centered and selfish with it. And it's like, well, I just want to be the best version of myself. And it's like, that's not what I want to do at all. In a selfish sport, I would have quit it years ago if I didn't have an actual reason and purpose for it. I want to be the absolute best version of myself so I can show what is possible by living compassionately and doing as little harm uh, to the earth and to others as possible. And honestly, it, it's, uh, 
I can't think of anything else that motivates me more than that. And I feel like that even more than how I eat is what fuels me to be a competitive athlete. And I think it's the thing that vegans have in common is that we have this, this purpose that is greater than ourselves to, to focus on and, uh, and, and become the best version of ourselves as a result. And what's great example. is that you as a bodybuilder are you're busting myths about veganism that people who are vegan cannot be strong and healthy um, and build muscle. So that's that's really fantastic that you're that's the number one I think that's the number one barrier that we vegans come up against mm -hmm. with meat eaters is that they feel they're afraid that, about the protein thing which I know you get a lot. I'm going to ask you yeah. this question because I know our listeners who aren't <laughs> vegan are going to want to know how, can you tell us how you get your protein? And obviously you get much more protein than any, pretty much anybody listening who's not a bodybuilder right? or maybe, yeah, a bodybuilder, not even endurance athletes don't even need the protein that you might need. Can you talk to us about protein? Because I'm sure a lot, when you're at those booths <laughs> talking to other um, meat eating bodybuilders, they ask you the same thing. Sure. So, uh, as far as getting protein in when I'm bulking, fortunately I have a relatively fast metabolism. So for me to maintain my, my size and, uh, and body weight, um, I need to get in around 4,000 calories a day. That's what I need. And I get a lot of protein in just by default because you know, my dark green leafies have protein, my beans have protein, my rice, like everything has protein. And I think, I think the issue is that when you come from a, a, an, 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 an omnivorous meat eating kind of diet, you think about protein isolation, you think about that egg white or that chicken or that steak that is literally mostly protein, right? But what else do you do when you have that egg or that chicken or steak? Do you eat it alone? Probably not. You round out your plate with other foods. So it's, it's, you know, and the reason being is because it will be hard to digest it on its own and you should be digesting it with your carbohydrates and fat. So as long as you're not dieting, like you round out your plate with other foods and you kind of just look at your, you look at your plate a little differently. And, uh, and in addition to getting in protein from all these other food sources that already have protein in, I'll add stuff in like uh, seitan or tofu, for example, um, nutritional yeast, nutritional yeast has a lot of protein. I'll just sprinkle that onto my vegetables. Uh, so you, you'd be surprised. How, and honestly, sometimes I, I, well, especially when I'm bulking, I have to make sure I, my protein isn't too high. Mm. Actually, when I'm dieting, it's a little bit of a different story. Now I'll maybe start to rely on, uh, on getting in a protein shake here or there. Um, but there's plenty of plant-based things that are almost entirely protein. There's been so a couple of studies that have been done. It shows that me, even meat eaters get a little bit more than 50% of their protein from plants. So it's exactly. just, right. It's not like that, that meat eaters, it's just coming. I mean, hopefully they're eating other things, but you bring up a good point of, um, you know, the reductionist approach that many people have with, uh, macronutrients, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And they're just concerned with, am I getting enough protein? Am I getting enough carbohydrates? It's like, you know, the cyclical never ending conversation and no one's talking about, um, antioxidants and deep dense nutrients that we want to fuel ourselves with. Right. Um, and the 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 fact that the the i think the more that we separate our foods with this reductionist approach the further away we get from eating a, a holistic approach right or, or eating a holistic plate full of food um why do you think i this to me just has started to be like a really specific conversation in the last few years and you'll hear people say things like oh eggs it's it, it is it is the you know the per, has the perfect profile it's the perfect protein Okay, but no one eats one food. Like if we were stuck on a desert island somewhere, I guess you would need something that had, you know, well, then I, you and I would choose quinoa, not an egg. But no one eats one food in, in the first world anyway. Um, what What is going on with this just obsession with just these macros? Gee, I, I don't know. The other thing that surprises me is, is you know, how pe how there's still that mindset that you have to have a specific protein with a specific range of amino acids to get the desired response out of it to stimulate muscle protein synthesis when really there's no reason why you can't get your amino acids from a variety of food sources and form a complete, like, I don't understand why 
people think that our bodies are that simple. Mm. We're a lot more complex than that. What you eat, like your body's going to know what to do with the combination of foods that you eat. It's not like you have to have X amount of the perfect protein in one food in order to get it right. Like it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, and as far as like getting back to the whole relationship with food thing, I, I have tried to, to make things work before and getting like the perfect ratio of, of carbohydrates, fat and protein to fuel my body. But I've done it, you know, I've done it without a holistic whole food approach, like just kind of, you know, we'll just say like junk food or comfort food or whatever. Um, just kind of not feel restricted and be able to say, Hey, I could eat pretty much whatever I want and still get the results that I'm looking for on the outside. But I'll tell you what, now that I feel, now that I understand like that no food is inherently like a bad food for you. Um, I've gotten back to a whole food holistic approach and I feel way better. So mm. even, even in the vegan uh, spectrum, when it comes to, uh, you know, like food that is devoid of nutrition and food that is nutritionally dense, the nu a nutritionally dense diet makes me feel way better. I've tried both. And it's like, there's really no reason not to incorporate more nutritionally dense food. So you're saying that you, you've eaten sort of a, not a whole, not as a whole food diet. I don't eat exclusively a whole food diet. I aspire to that. But so you're saying that you could eat one that has the right amount of protein, the right amount of carbs, the right amount of fat that's, and it's not a whole food diet it has kind of junk food. And it does feel different than a whole food diet with the same uh, ratio of macros is basically, right? Yes, yes, very much so. Off to a new subject, because I know you know bodies and you coach people to um, be healthy and strong and feel good in their bodies. And, I, and you have a podcast with your wife, Danny Taylor, and I listened to several um, episodes and it's really good. There's a lot of information in there. And you, you have one episode where you gave um, seven tips to lose fat on a vegan diet. And I know a lot of people think, oh, I'm, if I eat vegan, I'm going to eat too many carbs and that's going to make me fat. Right. So can you just give a couple of them or just, we don't have to go through all seven and it was um, early. We'll take was, five. Yeah, we'll take just some of the things that you tell people so that they can lose weight. And it doesn't always have to do with food. It has to do with routine um, and the things that you do outside of food, like writing down your, your what you eat and things like that. So can you give us a few tips? Because you know certainly very much how to change your body. Absolutely. So... At the, at the foundation of the pyramid, before you even start digging into food, is to make sure that A, you're, you're getting enough sleep, so focus on your sleep hygiene. Because if you're not getting enough sleep, your body's going to be run down. If your body's run down, it's gonna be stressed out. Cortisol goes into your system, and then you wind up getting hungry because you're stressed. So sleep hygiene is crucial. Hydration is crucial. More often than not, when we, we, find, when we over, find ourselves looking to overeat, it's because we're just trying to get the water out of the food. So sleep, water. And, uh, and how much sleep and how much water? How do we know? Uh, so, so for water, I would say any, I mean, it depends how active. Uh, we're I would both say drinking water right both now. Grabbing grabbing our water. Water bottle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why I have my gallon. Oh, that's a lot of yeah, water. Yeah, you drink you drink between one and a half and two gallons, I think. Is that right? A day? Between one to two, yeah. Are you are you like peeing every sweating. five seconds? Because I if I drink I try and drink four to five of these and I end up peeing every We're five old, seconds. So he probably's fine. <laughs> Let's just not go there. So anyway, sorry. Well, we digress. Okay. Uh how do you know if you're drinking enough water and getting enough sleep? Is there an hour like seven to nine hours is what I've heard of sleep? Seven to nine hours seems to be good. Some people need more. Some people I find need more than nine hours and some people can survive on seven and even a little less. Like for me, I found that I try to get as much sleep as I humanly possibly can. And I seem to never average more than like seven and a half to three quarter hours of sleep a night. My wife, on the other hand, if she sleeps fewer than eight to eight and a half hours, she does not function well. Mm. So it is that is very individual, but yeah, seven to nine hours seems to be the sweet spot. Water, I would say like anywhere from three quarters of a gallon to a gallon and a half is good for most people, unless you're very active and make, breaking a sweat all the time. And a little pro tip for a trick, because you mentioned like having to pee every five minutes. What, what I like to do is I sneak in at least half my water for the day when I train. I, I'm breathing heavy and it's very easy for me to drink a whole bunch of water. And as long as I'm getting in for the day, I'm going to be fine. So when you're training, chances are you're going to have access to be able to go to the bathroom 
I mean, as long as you're not running, I guess. But, um, but if you're training in a gym, for example, uh, you should be able to go to the bathroom often while you're training and drink more often while you're training and then kind of space out the rest of the water throughout the day. So that's, that's my tip to, uh, to people that we coach. Eating a lot of vegetables, you're gonna, not only going to get your nutrition in, but you're going to fill up your stomach and you're going to feel good. So that's another good tip on how to, to manage your, your weight. Um, yeah, and the nutrition is a, is, is a big one. You talked about writing down your food. Keeping a food journal. No, you know, so without even making any conscious uh, choice to change the way you eat or how much you eat, just by keeping yourself accountable. You don't even need a coach per se. Like you could keep yourself accountable. Some people need someone else to, to, to keep themselves accountable. To, but just keeping a little diary, you'd be surprised. You'll, you're going to wind up paying attention to what you do and be like, all right, I probably want to probably not want I don't want to have that second burger or you know I don't want to have like that that second piece of candy or whatever like you're going to be more mindful when you pay attention to what you're doing mm -hmm. but once you keep a food journal what you can do is figure out what your baseline is you know you're you're maintaining your body by eating the way you normally eat find out how you're normally eating and if you want to change your body now you have something to go off of a lot of people come to us like what's the macros what's the calories what do I need to do? Give me the plan. And it's like, I, I, I don't know what to tell you until you give me what you're doing right now. And then we'll go off of that. and change. I've been it. writing my food down for 18 years or something. Oh God. Yes. Okay. I do it that in horrible to me. No, no. It's, and I love it. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I go to chronometer, which is a online chronometer.com. And I just write it down. I never look at it. I just know that oh, wow. just, okay. just what just... Giacomo said, just knowing that I have to write it down makes me more accountable. I can't fool myself into what I'm eating uh, or not yeah, eating. Yeah, yeah. One thing that the very beginning when you said enough sleep, I mean, I think, you know, some people hear that, oh, I get, I'm not going to get fat if I get enough sleep. And it's like, wait, how are they connected? But um, it'd be great if you could explain a little bit that if we're not getting enough sleep, then we are um, accumulating stress, oxidative stress from maybe our workouts or just this, the stress from our life and our families and, and all the demands that we have. And so then your body uh, will hold on to more fat to help mitigate the stress. And that is very much the case. There's even been studies that have been done on um, people that are not getting enough sleep, enough rest, um, hold on to belly fat a lot a lot mm -hmm. easier than people who, a lot more than people who get enough rest. What's that connection between stress, sleep, and holding on to fat? It's, it's entirely hormonal. I mean, your, your hormones, your endocrine system controls your hormones, your hormones control how your body is going to react to everything. So you could take two people that are on the same diet, but if one person isn't sleeping as well, they're just not going to get the same results. And <laughs> that's why when it comes to uh, getting ready for a bodybuilding competition, we, you know, we, we tell people to make sure like their lifestyle is set up in such a way that they can focus on getting in the right amount of sleep and that it's not too stressful. And sometimes we even suggest people pull out of uh, competing because there, there's just too much stress going on. So yeah, mm -hmm. it makes a very, very big difference. And you're absolutely right about that, that your body can tend to hold on to more body fat when it's con when it's under constant I know stress. that if I don't sleep well, then I immediately feel more sugar cravings. Um, uh -huh. And so I'm, ah, I'm yeah. apt to eat badly the next day. I'm looking for comfort food, something that psychologically I want to raise my energy, which is right. sugar. Right, so. right. And get more of that hormone release. You want to get more endorphins. You want to get more dopamine coming in and that makes you go to the sugar. I'm like your wife where I'm like eight or nine hours when I was training. I was 10 or 10 and a half. And it was... It, to, quite frankly, especially now, it's rather irritating because it's just we don't have time for that. But if I don't, everything else falls apart. So then I don't can't do anything well. And if I'm going to do it well, I just know that's just the way that it is. It's just eight and a half to nine hours. That's just me. And I just, you know, accept it because I think a lot of people that are hearing this are like they're already in their head trying to fight that. Like, oh, I'm, I'm good on six. So that's a ridiculous amount of sleep, nine hours. It, it is or it isn't. It's just you know what you need and you know where you function at your prime. And if that's how much sleep you need, then that's that's what you need. Yeah, it's so true. And people, well, you know, I need more hours in the day to do what I need to do. And I think that's the mindset when people are scared. But what people don't realize, if you're a walking zombie all day long, are you really being efficient with all those hours that you need? Whereas you can get the right amount of sleep and you can be so much more efficient because you're more alert and more focused 
with the time you do have. So even if you, you know, where you lose an hour or two, you gain productivity and just being able to pay attention to what you're doing. I fought this for so many mm-hmm. years, you know, Danny tried to get me to sleep more. I'm like, whatever, I could function on six hours of sleep. And I was perpetually in a sleep deficit. And it was only until I got my, my sleep hygiene uh, improving and I felt what it felt like to get in the amount of sleep that my body requires af- uh, f- for being an athlete or not that I realized, oh, wow, like this is what it feels like to be more productive. Uh, so I definitely encourage people to continue. You know, I, I, I definitely harp on clients so like, you know, we need to figure out how to get you more sleep. Well, we're, we're almost at the end of our podcast. I had one question and then, and then Dotsie will finish with a question. Can you give us a meal that you like that maybe our listeners might want to try? That's not too hard, not too complicated. That's, uh, works for, uh, the average person who's not training for a competition, whether it's your breakfast or lunch, dinner. Yeah. Um, I could give you, I could give you a dinner and, uh, and I'll give you a breakfast. So for dinner, I think just going classic with some, uh, with like a baked potato, uh, a beyond meat burger and a side of broccoli would be nice and simple and delicious and nutritious and definitely one of my go-tos. And then for breakfast, I'm pretty simple. I just go with a, a bowl of oats with some fresh fruit. If it's a summer, I like berries cause they're in season. They just taste better. Uh, if it's the win- uh, fall or winter, I like pears or apples in there. And then I'll usually do like a protein shake on the side. Um, but sometimes I'll just get have like a tofu. I mean, we can go on forever about food, but <laughs> yeah, oats and oats and fruit with a protein shake on the side in the morning or a burger. And potatoes I love that you and broccoli. can go on forever. There's many choices uh, to I eat know. vegan, right? People don't realize Do you drink it. coffee or alcohol? I want to feel better about myself. Uh, I drink <laughs> yes to either regularly. one of those. Okay. Okay. Yay. <laughs> and uh, I take a break from it. I would say like every month or two to resensitize my body to caffeine. Otherwise, ah. it's just useless. And alcohol in moderation, like not even socially um, often. Uh, it's just something that I'm just, I don't know, just. I'm not opposed to it. Yeah, uh, okay. I just don't drink often. Before, do you feel better about yourself? Yeah, well, a little bit. I mean, <laughs> I, I think I like wine too much, but we're going to do that on another show. Um, <laughs> You're perfect to me. We're, oh, love you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so I want to make sure people can find you because you have uh, given us a, a lot of information and uh, it's been wonderful. And I know you're, you're helping a lot of people with just this uh, 45 minutes. So um, yeah, I do have one final question, but l- how do we find you? Website, social the easiest way to find us would be on veganproteins.com. And there's a contact button on our website that you can hit. And if you want to send an email, you'll get me and I'd be happy to get back to you. And then obviously we're, we stay in touch regularly on social media. And the best way to find me would most likely be on Instagram at Muscles by Brussels. And my wife is very at nice. Yes. And I can vouch great accounts to follow. I follow them. Uh, okay. So I want to know what switch for good means to you personally. Just the phrase, not the nonprofit, unless you want to talk about that. <laughs> Just kidding. What does it mean to you personally? Switch for good. I never actually thought about this, like the, the, the brand name itself, but, uh, but switch for good sounds to me like a cultural shift and a way for us to evolve as a species to not depend and rely upon foods that we don't need to be uh, consuming that are, are arguably harder, you know, like animal agriculture is unsustainable, bottom line. And until we decide to make that change and switch for good, we're going to be stuck in a situation where people on this earth can't be fed. People are paying way too much for food. There's too much of a strain on the environment. And, uh, and there's really no reason to not like literally just make that switch. Uh, you know, as soon as it clicks in people's minds, which I believe it is in the here and now. It's, it's pretty, pretty interesting to see it unfolding. Um, I think we're we're at the, uh, you know, I, I think we're seeing it happen right now. And and uh, and I guess that's what switch for good means for me. Thank you so much for well being said. on our podcast. We really really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you for helping everyone that's listening too. You were awesome. Tell Danny Thank hi. You. I will. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, 
please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to Switch for Good. This is the future.